All right, we'll go ahead and get started then. I got a lot of stuff to cover. So welcome to CSS Techniques for Blazor Developers. I'm Ed Charbonneau, I'm a Principal Developer Advocate for Progress Software. Uh, we build the Teller QI for Blazor, if you're familiar with any of the Teller products. It's a product that I work on. Um, and today we're gonna talk about uh, four different topics regarding using CSS with Blazor. And there's some things in here that are gonna help you organize your CSS code, make it a little bit more manageable, make it a little bit more flexible, or possibly even less flexible, depending on what your aim is to develop the styles for your application. So the first thing we'll touch base on is FAS. It's still a very popular fr framework for building CSS code. So we'll talk a little bit about what is it why do we use it still, and how to implement that in a .NET world. Uh, we'll talk about a feature that is uh, part of the Blazor framework called CSS isolation, and why we should use it, and how it compares to using something like SAS, um, and if it's compatible with SAS. Then we'll talk about component uh, styles, the scope of the style. So whether I'm able to change that style uh, inside of the component once it's been built, uh, how do I want to write kind of an API surface around uh, letting de other developers access the style of those components and change them, and do some theming, things like that. And then last, we'll touch on frameworks. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Bootstrap and Tailwind and see where they fit in the picture of all this. I also want to mention before I get moving too far along, all the slides that you'll see are written in Blazor using some of the techniques that you'll see in the presentation. So once I'm done, you'll be able to go on GitHub and grab the slides and tinker with some actual live code that you can play with and uh, see which parts of this you'd like to use in your projects. So we'll start off with SAS. Uh, SAS is something that I'm a real big fan of still. Uh, it is a preprocessor that lets you do additional things with CSS code that are not part of the current CSS spec. Uh, SAS has been around for quite some time now. Uh, it lets you do things that CSS doesn't normally do. One of the things that uh, CSS has now, but didn't back a few years ago, is have variables. And variables are extremely important to writing clean code. Uh, they let you reuse, uh, very, uh, reuse values over and over again, and it just makes things so much easier. Uh, they've added a lot of module systems and things to SAS, um, and SAS uh, originally was written in JavaScript, or sorry, Ruby. Um, and over the years, that has evolved as well. It is now written in Dart now. Um, and one of the things that people used to give uh, SAS a hard time over is the compilation speed. And that was the fact that it was written in these other languages. And now that it's written in Dart, uh, it's extremely fast at compiling your SAS code into CSS. So if you have an application that you want to write a theme that kind of stretches across the entire app uh, and you want to use variables to control things, maybe you want to have a light and dark theme. Um, I actually have an example of what something like that might look like in the presentation itself. Like I said, this is kind of a live demo of things that are possible when you use these type of tools. Maybe you want to implement something that you can easily swap out a couple values and change the entire theme of the app with. So you can do that in SAS. Um, I'll also sh show you how to do this in regular CSS now, uh, that we've got tools to do that in the language. Um, this also lets you break your CSS into modules. It makes them much easier to use uh, and reuse. Uh, so if you want to share pieces of CSS code across multiple projects, uh, SAS lets you do that as well. Um, also, if you're using Bootstrap, um, SAS is optional now. But uh, in previous versions of Bootstrap, you were essentially using code that was uh, built by using SAS. And if you added SAS to your pipeline, you could, um, you could trim down the amount of CSS code that was generated uh, and only pick the things out of the framework uh, that really you were using in your project and minimize the bundles that you ship uh, to your, your customers. It's also great for styling things that are not Blazor components, because Blazor, we'll talk about CSS isolation in a few minutes, uh, but there are things inside of your app that may not be 
actual razor components and you want to use regular CSS to style those things and you can elevate that CSS by using SAS. Um, installing SAS is actually something that I think a lot of people get confused by when they start working on a Blazor project uh, because a lot of the SAS documentation that you see when you start searching on the web pertains to things that use Webpack and the uh, Node way of doing things, so the JavaScript way of building applications. We're using things like uh, Webpack and some sort of command line system that was built for Angular or React or Vue.js. We don't really have anything dedicated to Blazor in this space. So you see a lot of uh, NPM install and scripting and um, uh, use of like Webpack plugins and things like that. Where in the .NET world, when we're using Blazor, um, we don't really, you know, we've chosen Blazor, so we don't specifically want to use these JavaScript things. We're trying to avoid Node uh, in some circumstances, uh, so, or NPM rather. So a lot of people don't know how to just install SAS kind of bare bones without all of those things, because that's where all the documentation is at. Uh, so since SAS is a dark binary, you can install this without NPM or JavaScript or any of those things. Uh, you can actually do this on um, any, any operating system. Uh, depending on what you're using, if it's a Windows PC or a Mac, you'll use Chocolatey or you can use Brew. Um, and then you can say Choco install SAS. Now you have SAS available on your system and then you just run it. So you run the SAS command, you have an input and an output and that's it. So once you have that installed, you can actually build this right off of um, your MS build configuration. So you can go into your uh, project and you can put in uh, these build targets and you can have SAS compile as your project compiles. So this can be super handy. So you don't really need anything like Gulp, Grunt, Webpack, any of that stuff. Uh, you can just install SAS right at the command line. Once it's on your system, you can hook it up through MS Build, and all it needs is an input and an output. Where is the SAS file located? Where do you want the compiled output to go? You can still use that node tooling if you'd like to, if you already have some other uh, node technologies um, in your project. Maybe there's some legacy JavaScript stuff that you're interrupting with. Um, it is possible to still do this. Uh, you're going to get faster, faster compilation times if you're using the Dart SAS uh, version of the compiler. But you can uh, run that command through NPM, or you can opt into the, the JavaScript uh, version of the tool. And if you are using those NPM tools, there's some handy stuff out there uh, for Visual Studio. So Mads Christensen has a great plugin called NPM Task Runner. And what this does is it inspects your package.json file. Right in Visual Studio, you'll get a nice GUI that you can go in and you can click on the individual scripts that are outlined in that package.json file and run them from the GUI within Visual Studio so you don't have to bounce out to the command line uh, to, to kick those things off. So that's a, a nice little plugin to have. So let's talk about CSS isolation next. This is a very Blazor specific thing. Now all frameworks, uh, modern web frameworks tend to have something like it. Um, and Blazor kind of gets influenced from other things sometimes. And uh, we have CSS isolation inside of Blazor now. And what it allows us to do is scope specific style sheets to components. So we're actually marrying up a style sheet with a component. And what this does is it helps us um, work with our style sheets where they are attached to a component. So if we remove that component from a project, then it also gets removed from the pro the style sheet gets removed from the project as well. It also helps with collision. Uh, so we don't accidentally override styles on other components uh, within that system. So it manages conflicts uh, with other components in their style sheets. And the way it works is actually pretty clever, and it involves the compiler. 
So when we write a component, the example on the left-hand side, we'll have some sort of markup in that component and a matching style that gets applied to it. So in this example, we just have an H1, uh, whatever the contents are, don't really matter here. Uh, but we're going to write a, a CSS selector to attach to that H1 tag. Now, the compiler is going to actually generate a unique identifier and attach an attribute with that unique identifier on it. And it will do the same thing for the CSS file that's associated with that component. So your output HTML and CSS by uh, the .NET compiler is going to be an H1 tag with this specific attribute on it. And then your CSS code will have a selector that matches that uh, very highly specific CSS selector. And what this does is it makes it so you can't accidentally write CSS that will override that style. It is nearly impossible to override that. Um, you can do it on purpose if you try hard enough, but uh, the compiler can um, generate a different GUID, and that's going to end up breaking that forced style override. So this will help um, if you really want to lock down a style where you don't want other developers going in and muddying up the CSS code that you wrote. Um, I've been on projects where you kind of open the end of your CSS file, and at the very bottom, there's a bunch of selectors that end in uh, a bang important, where somebody's tried to override something higher up in the system. And then when you kind of hit that plateau of uh, CSS code, uh, there's really no going back. So this prevents those type of things from happening, where you've got uh, your CSS code compartmentalized with your components, and then you've got this protection from overriding things by accident uh, and having those CSS collisions. Now, I, I do have kind of some reservations with this as well, because CSS isolation actually implies an anti-pattern. So CSS is cascading style sheets. And if we isolate it, then we've kind of removed the cascade from those style sheets. So it does come with some opinions. <laughs> Alyssa agrees in the back. Um, so it, it does come with some opinions. So if you're creating components that you need to control this style very strictly, it's going to help you. But if you need flexibility, it's going to then hamper what you're trying to do. And that's what we'll talk about in the next segment, is how to kind of manage that scope. So this is very narrow scoped CSS. So we're only scoping that CSS to the component. So there's some general rules that I've got here. Uh, we won't go through every single one of them, but I'll pick out some of the important ones. Um, like, use this when that style is very specific to that very component. So if you're writing an overall theme for your application, then you probably want to put that code in something like SAS or just a general style sheet, something that's very well organized but is accessible by all components. But if it's very specific to that component, then it can do very well in CSS isolation. Um, you might want to use a kind of a, a traditional CSS class or CSS file if you're going to be sharing this uh, component to lots of users. Because you want them to be able to control what that component looks like. Uh, if they, they were, your consumer is going to be doing any kind of customization, then you might not want to isolate those things. Um, do try to use it in new projects. See what you think of it. Um, see if some of these techniques uh, work for the projects that you're working on. But don't go to a project that's already constructed and works well and isn't broken and try to add, you know, rewrite the entire thing in CSS isolation because you learned it today. Like, use your time wisely. Um, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, another feature of CSS isolation is the deep selector. So you'll run into this on occasion where you have a parent-child relationship. You have two components that are nested inside one another. And you need to influence the style of that child component. Uh, so in the example here, we've got kind of a, a 
a uh, parent component that has this child underneath. And when we render that child component, we want to style uh, the H2 tag in there from the parent component. So in that component, I have an H1 tag, and then I also have our H1 selector, and I also have this deep, um, double colon deep H2 selector. What that means, it's going to uh, escape from that uh, CSS isolation by a level and let me style the component that is nested underneath. Now, my tip here is if you have a lot of deep selectors in your component, and I'm talking, you know, maybe two, three, four, you start seeing a pattern here, that's going to give you a clue that you need some abstraction instead of using the deep selector. You probably have another component that needs to be taken out and put in its own file. So I've run into that a few times. I'm like, this parent keeps influencing the style of all of these children components, uh, or this children, H, you know, all the HTML and the child component. There's actually multiple components that needed to be broken out and put in their own files and isolated as well. So you can find some code smells with CSS isolation. But like I said, with CSS isolation, you're kind of working against CSS where traditional CSS gives you the ability to theme the overall uh, you know, style of the application, where CSS isolation is per component, we're kind of locking this down, and we don't want anything to influence the look and feel of that component. And I like to set up this slide with uh, kind of a sliding scale of customization, where we want to find the right fit for what we're developing uh, because we need to tailor it to who's consuming the code we're writing. So for us at Progress, we make the Telerik UI for Blazor components. It's like 100 components that we're going to give, you know, or we're going to sell to many, many customers that have their own brands, their own themes, and they want to customize these things completely. Uh, so we don't want to isolate any of that CSS code. We want them to be able to uh, customize that as they see fit. So we've kind of got that first scenario where we have global customization. So we're at the very end of the spectrum here. We want uh, the end developer to be able to do whatever they'd like with the style of these components. Um, and we use, C we use SAS for ours. So we actually have uh, SAS code that's very easy to go plug in some new values and retheme the entire suite of components. And we even have a third uh, additional tool called Theme Builder that you can go in and use a, a WYSIWYG type of editor um, to actually theme all of the components. And that will generate the CSS and SAS code for you. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the extreme end there. And then the other extreme end, uh, the third one, is you know, minimal customization. We have this very strict brand at our um, company, and we don't want uh, you know, we want developer A to write the CSS code with a designer or, or another team. We don't want developer B to ever touch that. We don't want them to accidentally override anything. Or we don't want somebody going rogue and using their own colors, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's that minimal customization where we want to lock everything down. Um, and then there's kind of a nice balanced area that you can get into. And that's what I want to really show you today, is how you can use some additional techniques to make it where you can pick the spectrum that you want to be on. Do you want more global customization, or do you want to be more on the minimal customization side? But you don't have to pick one or the other. You can go in between, and you can open up an API for developers to go in and uh, tweak things as they need to. Because what you don't want to get into is uh, scenario where you've, you've gone with this minimal customization, your company gets acquired, and now you have a new brand, and you're going to go through all of these CSS files and replace a color value, something crazy like that. Uh, so there's a few things that can help. Uh, CSS custom properties is one of them. Um, I like this above uh, using uh, SAS variables. Uh, one, because it's uh, a native, uh, it's native CSS. 
It's, it's part of the CSS spec now. Uh, it doesn't require any third-party tools. SAS variables helped us get here, but now we have CSS custom properties, or CSS variables, as I like to call them. And uh, they're very easy to use, and they're very powerful. So uh, you define them by this uh, double dash syntax. So if we want to set a variable, we just say dash dash, give it the variable name and the value that we'd like to give it. To get the variable, we call the function var and then give it the name of the variable that we want to retrieve. And that'll get us our, our color or other value back. Um, these also follow the cascade of CSS. So this can be really helpful. So we can define a root level uh, setting, and then uh, we can override that with a selector later on. So within the scope of Baz in this example here, uh, we are going to get the color of FFF. All right. So that's going to be white if we're in the selector Baz, but uh, if we're in the, the rest of the application or the rest of the, uh, the HTML that's being selected, it's going to be black. Um, another thing that's nice about these, since we're not using a compiler, they can be altered at runtime. So that's, that's how I'm able to come in here and change the theme of my app, I'm actually using CSS variables here, and I can swap those uh, right at runtime. I could actually come into the browser here. Remember, this is a live uh, web application. And I could come into my app, and I could change the colors on the fly here. Uh, these are actually being ap applied through an inline style. I'll explain what this does in just a minute. But if I wanted to change the background color, I can actually do this live inside of my dev tools here. And I'll just throw red in so it's something nice and bright that we can see. Just to show you, that's going to override um, the theme of the application. Anywhere that variable is used, uh, that, that will get applied. So we can have that real time or runtime experience where uh, maybe we want to have uh, something where the user is able to set colors um, at runtime. Maybe we have some reports that we're you know, generating with components, and we want the user to be able to select the color of the, the chart or something like that that is coming out of uh, that code. So one thing that we can do is control scope uh, with component parameters as well. So CSS custom properties are more of a global way of controlling that scope. But parameters are kind of a narrowed down way of controlling scope. And this can be as simple as giving a component uh, some sort of Boolean flag, which I use in the presentation here for some different layouts. Uh, so there's a layout with a sidebar, um, and then there's a layout that is just uh, one single pane. And I just toggle a value on and off to switch between those two layouts. Um, you can also inject uh, some, some strings into your uh, class attributes. And for example, these buttons. Um, it's one button component, but we apply uh, these different strings, and uh, when we uh, ask for a button with the uh, success value here, we get the green button. So we can control these in a very narrow way. Um, I only have the ability to, you know, as a developer, to render these uh, five components or five versions of this button. So I don't have the full scope of being able to just completely change how the button looks, but I've given the developer that's consuming this button the ability to at least have five variations of it. So I've kind of got a, a narrower scope uh, versus a big global one that I can change everything. And then if we kind of mix these two ideas together and we use CSS variables 
along with uh, some parameters in our components, um, we can actually create scope that is similar to what we have in C-sharp code. So in this example, I have uh, a, the root selector here is giving a, uh, I call it public color just for the sake of example here. So this is a public variable that uh, I have access to. And it's set with blue. Inside of CSS isolation in the component, I have the component selector that I've called component scope. And it has a private color. So uh, I'm attaching these words here because we're hopefully CSS or C sharp developers and we kind of understand public private um, way of controlling scope. So I have my private color that is defined inside of my CSS isolation and it takes in that public color and it also has uh, a default. So if somebody didn't go in the root selector and define this color, I would at least get white from that color. So you can set defaults for these two. So what that means is in your top level CSS, you don't have to go out and define all of these and have you know, somebody come in and maybe wonder what they are, tinker with them and break something. Um, you could actually have these as a backup plan, you know, that acquisition uh, backup plan. What if our brand changes tomorrow? So you could go in and throw in this top level statement and then retheme the application at a global level. But we have our, our component scope here. We can even go further and uh, use that on a um, per element level. And then again, this, uh, these um, CSS variables, they obey the CSS rules. So I can even go as far as an inline style, make it very highly specific. And that's handy if I'm passing in a value from a parameter. So what I can get with that is if I'm passing in a value with a parameter, now let's make that guy bigger first. I can even data bind it if I'd like to. And then um, I can do something like this where I can choose the color of that component and restyle it like that. But it's only affecting that one instance of that component because I'm passing that value in as a parameter and it's overriding it at the style level so the global, the root value still remains for the rest of the components. So I can do that and I can actually data bind it as well because it's a proper or a parameter. So now I've kind of got the full scope. You know, this is that, that middle ground. So I have only the values that are exposed through parameters the developers can change. And then I also have some global values as well if I need to kind of override some of the, the theming of the application. Um, but the overall structure of the component, um, the shape of the, the bubble that you see here, there, there's no way to really get in there. Those are CSS isolated values. So I can't change that, the fact that it's a bubble, but I can change the size and the color of it all I would like. And I can do that at a global level. I can do it at an instance level. Um, I've kind of got the full range of scope there. And that's actually how I do the, uh, the application theming here as well. Uh, so I'm, um, I have a div tag at the root of the application, and there's a style uh, attribute that gets injected with all of the overrides uh, for that theme. Um, so you'll see uh, values for like the background, and a couple of the theme colors, there's about five different values here that get swapped out. And uh, because they're being specified at the style attribute level, they'll override everything else that's underneath. So we can set those values in a couple different ways. And um, depending on, on how you like to do that, uh, you can create kind of the experience or the API for your developers. Um, this is actually a library that I use or created um, to help with patterns like this. Uh, there's two different helpers inside of this library. Uh, one of them is called uh, CSS uh, Style Builder. The other one is called uh, Class Builder. 
so CSS Builder is uh, kind of this pattern. And we can call um, CSS Builder default. And this is what it's going to do is just generate a string of CSS classes. Uh, and we can put these inside of our, um, our class attributes on our components or our style attributes on our components. And it does all of the formatting for us, uh, separates things either by spaces, commas, whatever it needs uh, to appropriately render out a class or a style attribute. Um, and it does it in an intelligent way where we've got kind of a builder pattern here uh, where we can toggle things on and off. Because I've seen a lot of component code where we have some parameter that gets changed and there's like a chain of if statements that happen to kind of build up the, the classes or the styles that get injected into the attribute. Uh, so this says, uh, give me uh, the class uh, of item one and then give me item two or append item two when some condition is met and so on. And we can chain these together, and it makes a nice, uh, easily readable uh, code that we can follow. And that brings me to frameworks. So frameworks, um, I, I've been a big fan of Bootstrap for a while. Um, and then Tailwind came along. Uh, but CSS has evolved in a way that I've gotten very comfortable with. And um, I I'm able to write some really powerful CSS code just with the native uh, tools that are, are provided by the language. Um, with CSS variables, you saw that we've got quite a bit of power. Um, in CSS4, we're going to get some additional color um, functions. So we can give CSS a, a standard color, and it can generate variations of that color. So we can get entire palettes based off of one color. Um, and I think when this shift happens, we're going to see some of these frameworks start to fade out a bit. Uh, even SAS is going to become uh, useful, but not quite as useful as it has been over the past few years. Uh, so we should be able to do most things with vanilla CSS code pretty soon um, that a lot of these frameworks provide. So a little bit about Tailwind. Um, it's got free and commercial aspects of it. Uh, so they, they do sell additional components and templates uh, that go along with their, their framework here. Uh, their abstraction model is kind of strange to me. Um, I, have a, I have opinions on Tailwind. I'm not a, not a big fan of it because of this abstraction model. They like to take a lot of CSS and shift it into HTML for some reason. Um, doesn't resonate with me too well. A lot of the code that you see that is inline in HTML is verbatim the same code that it would have been in CSS anyway. Uh, which is really, really strange because you end up learning Tailwind and not CSS. Um, it does come with a uh, build system as well. So you need to have this build system to actually compile the Tailwind code. Um, it uses PostCSS instead of SAS. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with PostCSS, so I can't really compare it versus SAS. I don't really have much of an opinion there. Um, but uh, you, you do need this additional uh, tool in your system to be able to build out uh, the, the code there. Um, the main negative draw for me is the way that it, in, it puts all of this stuff in line uh, with your HTML code. And these examples here are pretty light. So you'll see there's three or four different classes that get attached just to theme this one um, thing. I pulled this right off their demo site. I think this is just uh, kind of like a header or something like that in a paragraph. Uh, so it's, it's kind of verbose. Um, and it gets so verbose, in fact, there's a plugin for Visual Studio Code that I've seen that will take these and uh, truncate them all the way down to like an ellipsis so you can hide them all. And to me, when I saw that plugin, it was like, oh, that'd be a great plugin if I could just take all of my CS, my you know, C-sharp code and put regions around it and like compress it down because that's about the same idea, isn't it? So I have opinions on Tailwind. It's, if you're prototyping, I think it's great. 
go ahead and, and do your thing there, uh, get an idea of what you want to build, and then, then use some of uh, the patterns that I showed you earlier. Um, or talk to Chris Santi. He's here as well. He's a huge fan of Tailwind, and he can offer a different perspective on it. Uh, because I know just because I'm not a fan of it uh, doesn't mean that you might not find it useful. So uh, make sure you give him a chat as well. Uh, Bootstrap, it's free. Um, they, they have uh, some themes that they sell, so there is a commercial aspect there. Um, they're, they're more of a CSS utility class. Um, I think most folks are familiar with Bootstrap these days. Uh, the things that were really powerful about Bootstrap, though, uh, to me anyways, were the layout systems. So you've got um, kind of that, that row and column layout system, the grid system uh, that Bootstrap came with. Uh, this is all part of CSS now. So there's CSS grid and there's Flexbox. And those two things eliminated about 99% of the reasons I've ever touched Bootstrap. Um, I have a whole other talk just on CSS grid and, and Flexbox. I can probably show a couple examples real quick at the end here, uh, but CSS grid and Flexbox are super powerful and they're, they're way easier than defining these rows and columns with Bootstrap. But again, if you're familiar with Bootstrap, you're already using it, it works for you. By no means stop using it if it works for you. And it's also a great prototyping system. Um, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, SAS is optional. Um, I think this might be a little outdated. I think five, uh, Bootstrap 5 is actually out now. Uh, and the reason that it is uh, no longer required, it's optional, is because of the power of CSS variables. And uh, they've introduced a lot of flexibility where SAS was required before. Um, so the newer version doesn't need it. Um, and then uh, th that's, that's about it for those two. And then, of course, there's Telerik UI for Blazor. I uh, talked about uh, me working for whoop, the browser just crashed there. We'll start that guy back up. Uh, I was just talking a little bit about the work that I do on that product and uh, our team does um, in regards to our Blazor components. Let's see if our, I think, the, here we go. Uh, so all of our stuff, the browser does not like my iframe that's in there. We'll just go to Blazor REPL itself. Uh, this is a free tool that we put out called blazorrepl.telerk.com. Uh, you can go to Blazor REPL, you can uh, create codes, Blazor code snippets here. Uh, this may be a networking issue. I keep seeing an error pop up on that. Um, you can come in here and write some Blazor code and share it with the community, embed it in your blog posts, things like that. Uh, it's kind of like a code pen or um, a JS fiddle, that type of a thing, but for Blazor specifically. And inside of here, um, we have some. Well, here, let's go to. You can actually go to our demos page and you can pop that guy open from any of our, our Blazor demos. And what I want to show, sorry, this is in that slide, but it keeps crashing, so we'll have to do it this way, is just how we handle some of our customization. And like I said, there's varying levels of customization that you might want to give your developers, and we did the same thing. So we can go into Theme Builder, um, we can customize all of our themes in Theme Builder globally. And then we also have these parameters that we gave our components so you can customize them on a per instance basis as well. So I have a button component here. Let's zoom in on that because I know it's a little small on the projector. And here's an example of uh, what I was doing in, in the slides earlier where we want to change some of the values of that button just on this one button instance. Uh, we can change the size of it, small, medium, and large. Uh, we can give it different rounded effects. So it kind of has a pill shape or a square shape. Um, we can change 
the color of that button. We have our, our theme selections that we can go through, primary, secondary, and so on. Uh, maybe it's a, a delete button, so we want to give that um, kind of that uh, red you know, warning effect there. So we can do these things through parameters, but then we also have that global theme that, that helps uh, steer some of these values. So we're, we've applied some of these techniques. Uh, we're, we're still working on some of the um, CSS variable stuff. We still use SAS behind the scenes to power all of this, because SAS is really the only way right now to get a full palette off of a single color. Uh, so it's, it's really helpful in, in writing these uh, themes when we have 100, 100 plus components, and those components might have children that have styles as well. Uh, so with all of our, our components, you, know, you can globally style those things, and then we have parameters and properties on those components that helps you tweak things. Uh, maybe if you need an extra um, you know, rounded button, different color, something like that on a, on a certain instance. Um, I'm going to go ahead, and we've got about 20 minutes. I'll go ahead and start taking some questions, because I do have the actual slide uh, presentation here that we can dig into and look at some of the code samples that I may not have gotten into very deeply in the, the actual slides themselves. So if anybody has questions, go ahead and, and raise your hand and I'll, I'll get those. Yes, sir. Uh, am I familiar with Mudblazer? So Mudblazer is another third-party component uh, developer. Um, the, the only thing I know about Mudblazer is they're, they're an open source uh, component library. Um, and we could, we could talk privately about some of the things that I've, I've heard other users uh, do, but I don't want to say it on video just because of the, the position I'm in. You know, I work for a competitor. I don't want it to sound like I'm trying to steer one way or the other. So, Yes? So the question is uh, regarding styling input components, um, and you're trying to style margins and in, in yeah. stuff like that on an yeah. input. Okay, is this um, the Blazor input component you're talking about? Okay, so the native Blazor input component. Um, so there's a feature in Blazor called splat attributes. Um, and I don't know if they have that implemented in, um, in the base components that, Bla that Blazor comes with. So there's a set of components in Blazor, you can do a form, and then there's various inputs that you can get um, that, that come by default. So, let's see. So when we develop components from uh, HTML elements, so when we're at the element level, let's see if I can find this here. Uh, there is something called splat attributes that we can apply uh, to our components. I can't find the documentation off the top of my head, but what it, what it essentially does is I can have a component and it's going to have some parameters that are actual like named parameters, uh, like color is a parameter on some of our, our components. Um, you can also opt in on your components to accept any HTML attribute. And then it, it will create um, a, a dictionary from those. So you could use things like style, uh, class, you know, any of the reserved HTML attribute um, values there. Um, and then you, as a developer, you need to decide how to inc uh, include those in your component. Now, the Blazor team, I don't recall. Uh, it's been a while since I've used their um, their input components. I don't know if they pass those style values down to the actual HTML element that's rendering the input. Um, by the sounds of it, if you're saying the styles don't get applied, then it sounds like they're not applying those. 
Um, so the, the spl attribute splatting seems to be ignored for style in particular or, or class. Is it it's inline style or class? It's equally just in the um, system, uh, one style itself. He maybe just said, I want all inputs to pass hmm. margin. I mean, it just doesn't work. It's, it's as if it's processing the same thing, then it's actually rendering that. It's doing something to render that thing after it, maybe not applying it. I don't know why, but it just, no matter how broad you are, it just ignores you. You're not doing it. And when I Google around, all I get is, yeah, it does that. The site is not helpful, you know. Okay. All right, I'll have to look into that a little bit more. Um, yeah, I haven't experienced that myself. Um, we, uh, when we work on our stuff, we develop everything from scratch. So I'm not too familiar with the, the native Blazor inputs anymore. Um, you should be able to style those though. I'm, I'm not sure why it would block that uh, from a global level. Uh, they, don't, they don't use CSS isolation on those. So yeah. Interesting one, yes. What about is it possible to combine, for example, put spin up and then um, CSS variables? So the, the, the way of working with variables in CSS, well, it is put spin up or CSS variables? Yeah, so that's actually a really excellent question. So the question was um, can we use CSS variables and bootstrap together uh, so we can have both? Now, uh, let's double check Bootstrap's website. Um, it's been a bit since I've used Bootstrap, but I believe we're on Bootstrap 5. And they have gone, uh, they've gone to CSS variables in Bootstrap 5. So uh, let's see if I can find it really quick. Um, Yeah, so they actually use CSS variables now. So we'll try to zoom this in uh, so we can see it better. And then they, they actually have this nice theme switcher here as well so we can get that up on the, um, on the screen. So they use CSS variables throughout Bootstrap now. So you'll see the double dash BS for Bootstrap. You have your styles, your bootstrap styles, and then you want your, your, your own CSS with your own personal stuff. Can you use them, the variables in your local class? Yeah, so, so the, the additional question here is can I use the bootstrap CSS variables in my own code uh, to style my components? And that's yes, because uh, they're, they're globally defined variables. Um, so you could pull in, just like they have here with var, uh, dash, uh, double dash BS dash blue. That would be whatever their blue color is that they've mapped. Um, you can use that in your own code, in your own components, um, or you could additionally ma just map that color to a custom variable. Uh, so if you ever break that dependency from Bootstrap, um, you just have to redefine the map. Uh, you, know, you could have uh, double dash foo dash blue would be yours. And then uh, you would just map the, the one color to the other. If you ever break away from Bootstrap, then you've got kind of clear separation um, away from that. Uh, we actually do this in our Teller components as well. If you use the Bootstrap uh, template or uh, theme that we have, so if we look at our stuff here, um, just any of the examples, Change theme. Uh, you will see we have a, a set of bootstrap themes. If you use our SAS code to theme your Blazor application or your Telerik application, uh, we will map those values. So if you already have some bootstrap in your system and then you're adding our components to it, you get the same theme across all of the components. And if you change the bootstrap colors, then our components will match those colors that you change to because we're mapping them in the background. Yeah, so that's, that's actually very common. It's a great question. More questions? Yes, sir. What's in CSS? Do you use 
So I, I think the question is kind of question slash statement. Um, so when you you were saying you do uh, CSS development, like you might have uh, kind of like uh, the BEM mechanics uh, that that you follow, where you're uh, kind of building up cl uh, like subclasses, kind of on top of a, a base class. So you might have like a button, but there's this button with some actions. There's the hover state. There's things like that. Um, and it, is there any improvements coming to CSS that's going to kind of help with that? Um, there's there's actually some stuff in the pipeline. Um, actually, I think it's out now. Uh, this uh, one of the things that's great to look at is the CSS state of CSS survey. CSS. So the state of CSS survey. Uh, they put this out every year, and people go on it. Um, they kind of they go through the survey and they they say like, uh, there's questions like, I know about this feature, I've never used it, I know about it, or I've never heard of it, that sort of thing. And they can kind of gauge where people are at with newer uh, concepts in CSS. And one of the things that is in CSS now, or is coming very soon. Um, I'll have to see if I can find it here and check it, is uh, layers. Uh, let's see if they have layers in here. Color shapes layout. We'll just go straight into layers, CSS layers. Uh, so layers is a concept that is similar to um, what you would see in like a Photoshop or something like that where you can set up different layers um, inside of your CSS, and you can apply those layers to different sets of uh, selectors. Uh, so this can help you uh, organize your code more modularly um, and apply different layers throughout your, uh, your HTML in CSS in your application. Uh, so that, that is one thing that you can use. Um, sure if there's anything else specifically in CSS, but this is a wonderful um, survey to go through and look at some of the individual features in here because when you find something in here, uh, I like to go through these and if there's something in here that I don't know, now that the survey is done and it's out, like um, this is an interesting one here, writing modes, for example. Uh, this is how the survey came back. And it says, all the gray here is never heard of it. Um, all of the light blue is people that know about it uh, and maybe haven't used it. Uh, but the dark blue is the people that know about it and have definitely used it. Um, so you can see writing modes, a pretty good majority of people don't know about it. It's gotten better over time. About 50% of people know about what writing modes is. Well, if you don't know what writing modes is, there's a link to MDN right here in the survey. So you can click on this and go into writing modes. And what writing modes is, it's kind of like a directional preference. Not all languages are left to right. There are languages that go right to left. So writing modes gives you that opportunity to, to uh, do globalization and make your interface where you can swap it for these writing modes that are right to left. With that, there's something called CSS logical properties, because when you start doing these type of things, uh, the semantics of uh, left and right become a little ambiguous, and you need things like start and end. So that's what CSS logical properties is, um, is it gives you a way of defining um, where 
uh, the, where the layout, or things are positioned in the layout. Uh, because if you're swapping these writing modes, uh, left and right no longer have the same meaning. So you might need start and end, for example. So there's, there's these different uh, logical property values. So this is a great place to go look for new CSS information and see what's coming out. Um, and another thing that's great about this is they have the can I use link right next to it. So if you want to know if you can use those different writing modes, you can just click on the thing you just learned about, and it'll tell you where that's at in the browsers. So I'll have to look up the layers one. Uh, so layers are, are pretty widely available, uh, except for a couple oddballs. So I'd say they're, they're pretty mainstream. So you can start tinkering with layers. Alyssa, how's it, you have a comment on that? So uh, Alyssa just said that uh, Tailwind actually uses this feature uh, to, to layer in some of their styles. So um, again, I'm, I, I have my opinions on Tailwind, but it's also a great, <clears throat> even though I don't use it, excuse me, <clears throat> even though I don't use Tailwind myself, uh, if you wanted to see an example of how layers are used, dig into their source code. Uh, that's another great thing about Bootstrap as well. A lot of the techniques that I learned about CSS came from Bootstrap. Um, it's a long, long story uh, since Bootstrap's been around for, for quite some time, but i um, actually friends with one of the original developers of it, and I learned a lot of my CSS code from him, uh, a lot of my CSS capabilities from, just from him. Uh, so um, just digging into the source code on both of those uh, just seeing how they organize their projects, their big projects, both of them. Um, they're excellent resources just for that fact alone. Like, how can I organize my project better? Go look at those two things. Uh, and then look at some of this, the CSS that they're using, uh, some of the newer techniques. So I think that, that was a good question. Uh, we've got, got time for maybe one more. If anybody else has a question? All right. I don't see any hands going up. Oh, did I miss one? Oh, yeah. Can you summarize the commercial and free side of what's used by Tailwind? Tailwind CSS and Tailwind UI is a lot of every same, so you have bootstrap material. I think like Tailwind CSS by itself is even in some expect things like instead of drop down menu, you would just be the big dark here. Yeah, so uh, there was just some comments about uh, Tailwind and some of the, uh, the free versus the paid stuff that's out there. Uh, so uh, it does have like those, those uh, utility type of classes uh, that you mentioned, like uh, P2, 4, all that is like different padding. Um, so what, what's nice is the, those frameworks give you um, kind of a starting point for like a white space um, system where they, they give you um, you know those those P1 through whatever that represents padding. And, and what what those are nice for is especially in like rapid prototyping is um, you don't have to you know just from scratch code out uh, like what is the white space in this application going to be like. They've got these predefined things that you can just start typing into the HTML and work with. Um, so there, there's some nice stuff there uh, to be had. Um, and then the, you're giving a little comparison about like what's free, what's not. Um, from the Tailwind perspective, um, if you just go to their site, like you'll, you'll start seeing it right away. Uh, the framework Tailwind itself, like all the CSS code part of it is free, but they have like these, um, it's not so much, in, there are individual components, but they have kind of like 
uh, patterns even that that are paid like they'll have like um, uh, like you'll see like the tiered pricing structure like type of thing like that I think that was one of them there's there's some predefined things that you can buy just kind of widgets outside you know out of the box that you can use so there there's varying things in the market that you can go for um, like we specialize just in uh, components and tooling so you'll find uh, charts graphs inputs um, and then we have like tooling that surrounds these things and does um, uh, like scaffolding theming and, and that sort of stuff and then there's there's the bootstrap side of it where they're they're focused on selling the theme for the bootstrap um, and then there's tailwind that kind of has a mix of stuff that's in there um, in the resources here you'll find a link to my web page on my web page, there's a little button for GitHub. Um, if you jump on GitHub, um, all of the uh, stuff that you see in there is under um, CSS for Blazor, under a repo in here, CSS for Blazor developers presentation. There we go. I'll put that link up there as well. Um, so you can find that on my, my website. So look for CSS for Blazor developers presentation, and all of the code that is in that presentation is there. Um, and this is a Blazor app that is just written for displaying the presentation itself. And each of the slides and components that are in the slides are in here. Um, and there's that, again, that example of the global theme. There's some SAS code in here. Um, it should just uh, compile if you have this SAS compiler installed. Um, so it should just start up and, and run normally. Um, so you may need to install that, that SAS prerequisite. Other than that, uh, all of the code is there to dig through uh, just to see how some of these examples are done, especially probably this guy here is a, is a nice one. Uh, that people might want to look at just to kind of understand how how that bit works and it can uh, kind of theme itself on the fly there um, so that'll be up there uh, but that is all I have and if you want to talk any more about uh, any of the things that you saw here feel free to stop by the progress booth uh, we're right here outside the um, the presentation room here uh, stop by our booth, uh, ask any questions about the presentation or, or any of our components that we have, and we'd be happy to answer that for you. Thank you very much.